My guest tonight is an Academy Award-nominated actor and Golden Globe winner. He's appeared in dozens of memorable films like Boogie Nights, Crash, Hotel Rwanda, Iron Man 2 and 3, and the Avengers movies. Good Lord. He also stars in the fantastic Showtime series Black Monday, which just began streaming its third season. Please welcome the accomplished, the extremely busy uh, gentleman, Don Cheadle. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. You know what? Um, I, you did not have any facial hair when I started reading your credits. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long it took. You grew, yeah. you grew a full-on yes. beard. It's the picture what? of Don Cheadle Gray. <laughs> it just all came in. <laughs> Thanks for being here in person. I have to say, uh, I had an experience. I, I, we were choking around before uh, the, we started taping about how much people love you. Uh, and um, I was at having dinner with my wife and my son was there. And uh, this is quite a while ago, but you were sitting at another table and we went over and we yeah. said a quick hi and you were very nice to my son and my son freaked out and he does not freak out about celebrities. But on the drive home, it was, that was Don Cheadle, that was Don Cheadle. Avengers just losing his mind to the point where I became enraged. <laughs> I became jealous. Hey, knock it off. I will pull this car over and pull out my resume on you so fast. I will tell you some of the things I did. And you're like, I know what you've done. It's no, Don Cheadle, and it was, uh, yeah, so you ruined my night, I want to say. Sorry, man. Yeah. I think it's your fault for coming over. I think I shouldn't have you come You could have just walked right out. I tried to. I tried to just dash out, and my son was like, that's Don Cheadle. We have, we got to go say hi to Don Cheadle. That was uh, a fun yeah, night, too. Yeah, but thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. You know, Andy, jump in at any moment if you want to say anything kind about Don Cheadle, who's beloved. Or, or anything, Andy. Just I mean, anything. You can do some of that hatred that you were doing before we what? started. What? Hatred? No. It's called constructive criticism, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's a standard thing we've been doing here for 28 years on the on this ver versions of the late night show, which is just before we talk to someone, Andy gives them a lot of really strong constructive criticism yeah. that comes across as hate, and then we go action and we start the interview, and I think it helps. That's right. Well, that's right. Shouldn't constructive criticism give the, you the ability to somehow fix it? It's just not like <laughs> you're just Don Cheadle and you suck. It's like what can I, <laughs> what can I do? How can I fix that? I yeah, but I mean, I can only lead you to water. You got to drink yourself. <laughs> you know what's great? Uh, you, obviously, you've had such an incredible career, and uh, and I'm acting like it, we're wrapping it up. Your career, um, no, uh, you. you are uh, you're just killing it out there all the time. But you know, I'm always impressed with you're such a uh, very and it's not maybe the first thing people would think of, but you're so naturally funny. You're a very funny oh, guy. Thank you, man. And I always notice that when we chat and, and when I bump into you, and I thought, oh, what, has he ever used that before earlier in his life? And then I found out that you tried stand-up in high school. I, what was your act like? I foolishly did do that. Um, I was with a friend who is as ridiculous as I was, and we thought, we could probably do this. We were driving by um, Larimer Square. I think the comedy is a comedy store. There's mm -hmm. some right. place spot there, and they had an open mic night. And it was Friday night, and we had just had a week of whatever at school, and we thought, you know what, we're theater geeks, we could probably do this. So we went back to my house, and we had a bunch of, you know, cards, and diag we, we, our humor was like we diagnosed the humor of Nancy, the comic strip Nancy. <laughs> what? Which Nancy is not as in funny. Nancy and Sluggo? That's right. The, 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 the comic that no one has ever really been able I think yes. Henry Bush Miller did that comic, and it doesn't make sense. No, it's objectively unfunny. There's nothing <laughs> funny about it. So we diagnosed the humor of Nancy for everybody to explain why it was indeed hilarious. Uh, we did uh, a series of Pope Francis jokes with him on the shitter and a, a bishop holding his hat while he told the worst jokes in the world. Okay, great, great. So <laughs> you killed. had the material. Let's we face had it, you the had the material. We had the material. I don't know how, but we had it. And we went back that night, and you know we're too young to be in the club. We're 17 years old, uh, but we did it, and it was great. And we had a, it, it worked. It worked. Wow. So the club owner was like, okay, why don't you guys come back next Friday? We're going to have another open mic, see how you like it, just try it out. So we did and worked up a bunch of other material and uh, a game show where, you know, if you got the answers wrong, the consequences were deadly, not just, you know, like right. reaching the bag and get bit by an asp. It was like stuff like that. Right. Uh, killed again. 
was like, this, this is incredible. This was incredible. You could have had an amazing career. And then what we, happened here? Then we did it again. <laughs> oh, <there's, laughs> until you already know. Okay, it's the third time. There you go. Which what is, happened the third time? Well, uh, in front of an invited audience of family and friends and, and others, uh, it didn't go as well. Uh -huh. um, and the collective sound of individual people groaning, <laughs> the groan that like, it was pretty bad. Yeah. So we, we bombed and I've never felt anything that horrible. It's bombing on stage and stand, there's nowhere to hide, there's nowhere to pass the ball, you just have to stand there. You're praying that the, the time is, is up really quickly. You can't walk off. It was just bad. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Never happened to you. <laughs> you know what I always say is when you can hear the air conditioning. <sighs> that, when I can hear the air conditioning and yeah. sometimes it gets so quiet you can hear cells dividing in people. <laughs> like bloop, bloop, yeah, bloop. Yeah. And uh, it is uh, the most horrible thing. So that night, and it's interesting because your first two times you're killing it. Yeah. And then it's that third time where this sort of reality sets in of this is not what it will always be like. Right, yes. This is not what it will be like for the next three minutes while you have to stand up here. And it was so bad. It's like, you know, on the way home, my parents didn't talk about it at all. We talked about other things, right. didn't, didn't mention it. We're like, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's not that's bad. The, that's death when you get in a car after a show and people that were there don't say anything. No. They just say, so we want to get something to eat? <laughs> exactly. Eat. Let's just move on to Shouldn't the next Shouldn't we thing. talk about what just happened back there? I don't. I don't think I so. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you want that. <laughs> Do you, you come from a funny uh, family? Is your mom funny? Mom was funny. Dad was funny. Mom was, you know, mom was funny slash dangerous. It's like, oh. you know, my mom grew up, and both my parents are from small towns in, in Midwest, but my mom grew up in kind of a bad area. And uh, when she was young, she actually carried a gun. She carried a little 38 that oh, wow. I found going through her stuff. and. You know, I gingerly asked her about the gun, you know, and she said, oh yeah, I've had that gun for a long time. I carried it when I was young, but I, I had to stop carrying it. And I said, why? She said, because excuse me turned into move. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> that is some experience to Isn't find, it? like, I'm just going through mom's purse. Oh. Lipstick and compact and 38. Oh, 38. I guess I'm gonna listen when mom asks me to do something. You know, um, think, I was just thinking right now, there's this image, I think about this often. One of my favorite sort of funny images that comes to mind sometimes is in Boogie Nights when your character is trying a new look. Oh yeah. And you have the, the, yeah. the, the, the wig and this, I forget what the, what the name was, was it? I think it's kind of Earth, Wind and Fire. Earth, Wind and Fire, yeah, maybe slash Rick, Rick James. James. Rick James, yeah, yeah. and you look, you're alone at a party and you're despondent wearing that outfit. And it's, it's just such a great, there's so much comedy in that moment and sadness it's at the same a, that, time. That moment, in fact, was so PTA, Paul Thomas Anderson, who directed that. Mm -hmm. So I get in the getup, I'm sitting there, and he comes over and he says, okay, now in this moment, I just want, I just want nothing. I just want nothing, nothing happening. And I was like, nothing, I don't know, okay. So we shoot it, get cut, he comes over, he goes, you were kind of doing nothing. I just want nothing. <laughs> Like nothing. I'm like nothing. He's like, yeah, just, just give me nothing. <laughs> and so I, I'm sitting there trying to figure out this. It was like a Japanese koan, you know. I'm like trying to figure out what he means. Yeah. And he comes back. He goes, okay, got it. Thanks. <laughs> so, so while you were trying to figure out his direction, he got what he, he needed. Yeah, he rolled on the camera. You know that scene I'm talking about, Andy? It's mm -hmm. just, it's so, I, 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 there's so much. I love that movie. It's a great but movie. there's this, uh, you're, you sitting there totally despondent uh, and I feel like, yeah, I've been there many times in my life. I haven't, been wearing, I that, I haven't been wearing that <laughs> wig. I've probably been wearing another wig or another right. costume, but I've been totally, like my soul has left my body. Yeah, and, and, and it was such a brilliant way for him to, to get at that because the direction was baffling. Yeah. And I think when I look at it, that's the look on it, on my, there's just nothing in there. It's just like some <laughs> empty vessel. Like, why am I in this movie? Why did I let him talk me into this? <laughs> that would have been a perfect time to think about Nancy comics. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's the, a callback, I yeah. think. Yeah, the, um, I gotta <laughs> ask you, you yeah. I gotta ask you about, uh, you know, no, I'm sure you're not allowed to talk about it, but you were in the Space Jam reboot. Yep. 
And that means you've been working with LeBron James. This is true. Now, I know I'm not allowed to ask about like specifics about the project, but LeBron James is one of those people where I have to think, uh, what kind of energy is it? You've worked with all these top actors, but you're working with someone who literally has the title like King, yeah. King James, <laughs> yeah. and he is revered and he is this force of nature. What's it like working with him? In the in, 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 while acting, and yeah, just it was it was great actually. I mean, he really did approach it like a, a team player. He really did approach it like he would approach the sport because he didn't have it. I mean, he's done a couple. He did Trainwreck, mm -hmm. and he's done a, a couple other things. That's right. He really still, you know, thinks of it as a sport in many ways. Right. <clears throat> and as he does in the game, he was like always there, always ready, always prepared, ready to try something, ready to just go all in. And you know, at some point I was like, you know, you could be a much bigger diva than you're being right now. <laughs> you are King James. You could. Yeah, yeah. But he was just always, the only time that he really required special treatment is when that huge human being had to eat. So there would be certain times he'd be like, oh, got to eat. And we would sit there and wait for 15 Minutes. When he and what would he eat? He's not just having like a Tic Tac and a diet soda. No, it was usually tissue paper, and he's very concerned about his physique. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he would eat whatever his person would bring out, but it would be you know substantial, and he would sit there and, and eat, and yeah. would, we'd have to sit and wait. And I was yeah. like, I'm going to start doing that. That's important. We don't do that enough. We don't we don't focus on. You know, because you've been on set, you know what it's like. You know, you work 14 hour days sometimes. And if you don't really take care of yourself, by the end of that thing, you could be done. And he was, you know, nursing an injury. He was still putting the team together at that time. Sometimes after we shoot, he'd go do practice. Sometimes before we shoot, he'd have practice. So I can't, it was a grueling schedule for him. So what you're advocating is that at any moment, I should just say, I can stop anything and say, I need to eat. And, and then a, a giant, you know, rack of lamb is brought out. You're Conan O'Brien. I can't believe that it took this for you to, to figure that out. Are you hungry now? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were, and I don't like it. lamb. I'm not really a lamb guy. Right. See, it's falling apart yeah, already. Yeah, it already isn't working. And also, it's not going to work. I'm going to say, hey, I need to eat. And they're going to say, well... It's going to be 40 minutes <laughs> to get the Olive yeah. Garden to deliver. Oh, so. it's the Olive Garden. That's your go-to. Yeah. It's nice. the bread. Just, lo uh, just, just the a only, big old basket just, of bread. Just the big old basket <laughs> of bread. Uh, you, uh, you know, before we, we started talking, you were checking out, there's a guitar there, there's a guitar back there, and I know that you're a very, uh, you're a very well-trained jazz musician. That's I, fair to say. You actually, mm, you know your stuff. I, I, I studied it very hard in high school. And when I was, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do in my life, music was one of the options that I was considering. But, you know, being such an aficionado of the music and really a student of it, and probably mixed with some amount of uh, neuroses and, and uh, lack of confidence in that area, I kind of didn't want to pursue it because I just knew what shedding as a musician was going to be to get mm -hmm. to where I wanted to get. Mm -hmm. You know, when my musical heroes are Miles and Charlie Parker and Cannonball Adderley, and like I'm shooting like that, going, I'm going to have to really dedicate my entire life to this focus. And it was, you know, music is kind of elusive to a brain that doesn't like it math sometimes. You know what I mean? Yes. There's a lot yes. of structure in it that. I would sometimes just go into a fog. I was have a great ear, had a great ear, could always fake my way around stuff. But I was like, if I'm going to really have to dig into theory, the amount of time I'm going to have to take, I think I'm just going to be an actor. Well, <laughs> I think you made it. I That's think you made a good choice. First well, of all, it's worked out pretty well. It's, it's, I'm doing all right. Yeah, you're doing kind of okay. Yeah. Um, but do you ever do you play music now? Do you ever? Do you play jazz in your in your free time? I do, I do. I've started to you know pick up the bass a few years ago, and it's great to just. I mean, they're beautiful, right? It's great to just have them sitting around on a stand. You have 20, 30 minutes, just pick it up and like get into it. So I've been doing that uh, a lot. Do you, was, do you do vocal stuff? Do you ever do vocal jazz stuff? I haven't. I mean, I sing just to mess around, but that's when I was uh, in high school. That's basically what we did. That was mainly one of the things I did. I had scholarships. I was fortunate enough to get scholarships to 
uh, attend universities and study vocal jazz and jazz. That was going to be my my metier. That's I have never thing. studied uh, vocal jazz in any way, but it's one of those things I know that I would master immediately. <laughs> you, I get that from you. Yeah. You have vocal jazz vibes coming off of you. Thank you. In waves. I've never been more serious about anything in my life. I just, I, I, I and I don't mean, I know it sounds arrogant what I'm saying. Oh, it it's does. Just, it's just a statement of fact that I can but, just, yeah. I can just touch. You could just give me, uh, you know. Is I, that piano tuned? I mean, you, you hit a G or give you just a. Can you give me a G, you know? Let's, give let's, me a G over there and I'm going to give you. Thank happens. you very much. Just give me a G. Scooped up, dally do 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 shema hi hi ha so sabada kadai mashi mashi have the pa ho was are we... <laughs> I thought there was a pinter pause. You knew there was a little more. I knew there was more in you. That was more gas than anything else. <laughs> the last at the end. part. It was yeah. Just a, yeah. So an that's just something I don't like to talk about a lot, but I could see why. <sighs> I think it's time to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> this is that moment. This is that moment that we foresaw. I really enjoyed watching your face during that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it was what? amazing. It was a return to your Boogie Nights performance. You looked completely lost and, just, and filled <laughs> my with, soul left and my filled body. With <laughs> I was bereft of spirit at yeah. that moment. Let me ask you about. Uh, let me ask you about Black Monday. Uh, this program has been. It started out in the '80s, mm -hmm. okay, and we're talking about going through this this massive. Uh, and a lot of people watching right now, young people, don't know that in 1987, yep. biggest stock market crash of all time occurred. I remembered I was just starting in the business uh, out here in L.A., yep. and it happened, and people were wondering, are ATMs going to just stop working? Are we all going to be around burning trash cans, you know, hunting for food? We didn't know. It was that dramatic at yeah. the time. Of course, it didn't turn out to be uh, that, but it was... A massive stock market crash. Yeah, it wiped out a lot of people. It wiped out a lot of people. And um, that is really what your show has been centered around. But now you're in, what, this is the third season? Third season. So you're in the 90s now. We're moving into the 90s, toward the end of it. Um, kind of, it's, well, not to give away anything, but it kind of, that's where we're, that's where we're trending toward it uh, at the, in the 90s. And, you know, at this point, Don's character, uh, Don, played by Regina Hall, yeah. she's been in jail for trading, insider trading, for the Black Monday crash. Mm -hmm. My character has been has been a part of so many nefarious trades. He's lost his license. It's like we can't really be in that business anymore. So they're trying to figure out what do they do now, and right. how do they, you know, matriculate into the real world and, and right and still you, behave badly. And still use their skills as horrible people <laughs> to <laughs> impress upon the world. But at least now will. you're getting into the music of the 90s, the style of the Absolutely. 90s, you know. Yeah, which is a lot of fun. I mean, that's always the most fun on the show is the, the commentary that we get to do, you know, about today, really, dealing with that time period. And that's always the fun is how to, to play with those sort of cultural uh, uh, mores and the things that yeah. uh, we were really reminded of during that time to see how far we really haven't come in many ways. Well, I'm just going to put this out there and you can talk to, you know, the creators and producers and stuff, but Andy and I started uh, our show in 1993. So if you want, Andy, we could get made up to look like ourselves almost 30 years ago, wow. and we could come on as ourselves, your characters could bump into us and be right. like, wow, Conan, O'Brien, Andy Richter, you just started the late night show. Right. Um, why do you guys look like you're in your 50s, late Oh, that's 50s. what we would ask. That we'd be like, wow, what's wrong with you? Are you, yeah, are you guys we'd have sick? To, yeah. We'd <laughs> 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 but we'd have to explain why we don't look 30 and you know 27, that's how old we were when we started. Right. We'd have to write in something like we got really bad food poisoning and then right. we got radiation uh, blasted. And we could do yeah. a Chernobyl, like a Chernobyl. Yeah, yes. Yeah, this is, this got, this has potential. Yeah. Yeah. 
TV subtracts 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> it adds 10 pounds. And, and subtracts uh, yeah. Subtracts years. years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You're also, I mean, talk about, you're, as I said, you're absurdly busy. You're narrating the reboot of The Wonder Years. Yeah. That's a pretty cool gig. Yeah, that is. I mean, uh, the, I, we've just shot the pilot, um, and it's really cute, and Fred Savage is still involved. Um, and he, it, it's great to have him there and, you know, have this touchstone to the past. And I think it really keeps the same spirit of the show. It's just, it's, it's, it's been a lot and of And Fred fun. Savage is still playing a child. He, which, and he still looks like a child. He could come on and there would be no difference, except he grew, he just would be taller, but he looks yeah. exactly the same. He does look, he always kept that childlike, elfin. boyish thing, yeah. Yeah, sort of elfin. Um, you also, a uh, new movie that you're in, it's coming out, directed by a little known director named Steven Soderbergh. That's the guy. Uh, who's finally caught a break. Uh, and, and this uh, film is called No Sudden Move. What can you tell us about that? Uh, no Sudden Move is a noir film set in 1955 Detroit. It was actually the first movie that came back, pretty close to being the first movie that came back after all the pandemic stuff that shut everything down, um, which I blame Stephen for because he directed Contagion. And there you go. I think he put it into the world, let's be <laughs> honest. I say he's patient zero. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we shot it in Detroit uh, last year, and uh, we're going to be the centerpiece for the Tribeca Film Festival, the June That's 18th, fantastic. so it's kind of cool. We're really looking forward to it. We have a clip here we were gonna show from No Sudden Move. Anything you can tell us uh, for this clip? Um, it's amazing. You guys aren't in it. Uh, that's not why it's amazing. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, I think this is my character kind of um, dealing with the, 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 the setup. This is what we're about to deal All with. All right, let's take a look at this clip from No Sudden Move. Mister, you mind sitting up front? I do. I'd like to sit in the back. This is ridiculous. We're wasting time. Be my guest. Kurt, meet Ronald. Ronald? Kurt. I love it all. His, the hair, too. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely Benicio, incredible. Amazing, yeah. Um, and first of all, I would love, I would love being, I mean, I'm not an actor, but if I was in a period film, I would just love getting to wear those clothes. It really and, does. And drive around in those cars, and yeah. you'd probably start to feel like, yeah, it's 1955. 100%, 100%. And the great thing about Detroit, you know, good and bad, I mean, it's, there's elements of Detroit that haven't really moved on in ways right. since then, in the neighborhoods that you can go to and kind of see um, the same architecture. It's one of the few places like that. I think Cincinnati's another one uh, where you can shoot and kind of still feel like you're, you're back then. Right. And all the great car stuff in Detroit, you know, it was the mecca. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun and very scary to be back on a set that soon after everything. But Steven really, uh, you know, he wrote the protocols for the DGA and he really protected everybody and we didn't have any incidents, so we were very fortunate in that. Yeah, regard. it does seem, I mean, unless I'm wrong, but it feels like on t in television and uh, in movies, they really got their shit together and figured out a way to keep people safe because yeah. there's been a so much work's been done and people have, you know. Yeah, for the most part, very People well. for the most part overwhelmingly have been safe, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, Black Monday, we got through without any stops, you know. Uh, we were very fortunate in that too. So it's, it's, you just have to take it seriously and it's real and it's not a joke and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we can do if everybody behaves, so yeah. yeah. Well, uh, make sure I get the word out, Black Monday, airs Sundays at 10 on Showtime. No Sudden Move will be available on HBO Max July 1st. Don, every time I talk to you, I'm reminded what a great guy you are, what a gentleman, oh, how talented. Sorry. Don Cheadle, thank you so much for being here. Thank really you, Really appreciate it. Glad to be here.